Now we're going to take a look here at example one. And we're going to look at a bunch of different examples here where we are going to attempt to find the most general antiderivative for each of the following functions. Remember that means that I'm going to be trying to find a function whose derivative will equal what I have given in each of these individual parts. I'm trying to again reverse the process of moving down this list and instead move back up it, undoing derivatives. And to make them as general as possible, I'll be sure to add plus a constant to the end. So let's take a look here at each individual part and work through them together. So here, I can see that I'm interested in attempting to find a function that when I take its derivative, I end up with the answer of sine of x. Well, I can always start to experiment. Notice that one possible starting answer here could be maybe a cosine. Does this work? Well, the easiest way to check this would be to say, if I took the derivative of the cosine function, I know that I get negative sine of x. So I didn't really accomplish the task. I have this extra negative that I'd like to kind of get rid of. And the easiest way to do that would be to just put a negative on the outside of this cosine function to begin with. Now when I take its derivative, I'm going to get negative negative, cos or negative negative sine, which is positive sine, which is exactly what I'm shooting for. So I found an antiderivative. But again, to make it as general as possible, don't forget to add at the back, plus c. There could really be any number back there, plus a 0, plus a 10, plus a pi. It doesn't matter, because when I take the derivative of this, that constant will disappear, and I'll just be left with sine of x. All right, let's take a look down here at part b. What about if I was working with x to the power of n, where n is just some real number. So maybe I could imagine like x to the seventh power. Well, let's deal with this specifically and see kind of how this would work. So if I was dealing with x to the seventh power, then notice x to the seventh power, hmm, if I'm thinking about undoing a derivative, it's going to be helpful to think about derivative rules. What could I take the derivative of that would produce an x to the seventh? Well, something like an x to the eighth power could work, because I know its derivative would produce an 8 times an x to the seventh. But the issue is that I don't want the 8. I'd like that 8 to, again, completely disappear. And so how can I accomplish that? Well, what I'd like to do is just divide by the value of 8 then in the front. So when this constant of 8 comes down, it multiplies to the 1 8 and completely disappears. So to generalize this, I can see that what I've done is ultimately I've taken my power uh, and, my, and I've used the power rule in reverse. So I've added one back to the power. I've increased it a step. And then to catch the value that comes down from the power rule, I divided by that new power. So notice here, that would look like saying x to the power of n plus 1, add 1 to that new power, but then be sure to divide by whatever that new power actually is. Of course, to keep it as general as possible, I would add plus c. Let's take a look down here at part c. Again, I'm trying to find a function whose derivative would be equal to 1 over x. Now, this one here is a little bit challenging and probably the most important one for us to know. You might want to circle this one and star it up because this is a really, really valuable one to remember. Because a lot of people will think back through their derivative rules here and they'll go, oh, Kyle, this is really easy. The derivative of the natural log of x will produce 1 over x. And, oh, Kyle, to make it the most general, I'll even add plus c. And an answer like this is, only about half right. And the reason I say that is because what you'll notice is that in this function, I am allowed to plug in both positive and negative numbers. Whereas in this function, I'm not allowed to plug in negative values because natural log uh, is not defined at negative values. So the most general antiderivative goes back to a derivative rule that we talked about way, way back in chapter three. Specifically, we talked about it in section 3.9, and you could go back there to take a look. Um, this will 
be the actually uh, most general antiderivative, the natural log of the absolute value of x. So this is really crucial to note. When I'm undoing derivatives of a 1 over x, the best thing I can do is to write a natural log of absolute value of x. And again, to see why that's the case, you can go back and take a look at your notes from 3.9, where we show that the derivative of this is still actually 1 over x. All right, let's take a look here at one more. Um, what about if I had a function that was just e to the x, and I wanted its antiderivative? So where would this come from? What do I have to take the derivative of? So e to the x is the answer. Now, this one here is actually super easy. Um, it's e to the x. And of course, to make it the most general antiderivative, I can say plus c. So of course, the key here, really, in all of these parts is to start by thinking about um, my actual derivative rules. And I can check all of my work by just saying, whatever capital F function I create, I take its derivative, and I see if I actually generate um, the little f function that I was given.